Good morning. Uh, we are really thrilled to be here. Um, this is Edge in Education. And so the purpose of Edge in Education is to connect what is going on with the professional educators inside of the system with parents who are consumers of the things that are going inside the system and making that connection. So that's what EDGE is about, EDGE in education. Connection between what we are learning and doing inside of classrooms and inside of our school with parents who are saying, what are you doing inside of classrooms and inside of our school? EDGE in education. Um, this was invented uh, a number of years ago and, and parents really have found value in trying to understand what it is that we're learning and how we're growing as a school system. I always start every single um, uh, talk with parents with what I believe and what we're about. Many of you heard this before, but I will say it again. Um, what we believe, we believe that all kids can learn at high levels. And when we say all kids, we mean all kids. We also believe that every student is unique. They bring their uniqueness to the table. And our job as a school is to celebrate, identify, and help kids figure out that uniqueness. I often talk about my two girls uh, that I raised. My oldest one, Emily, I talked to both of them last night. They still, and they are 33 and 29, and they still have these traits through and through. Our oldest is organized and driven and a bit of a psycho uh, when it comes to spreadsheets and color coding. And my youngest is disorganized and flighty and creative and, and, and warm and fuzzy. And this one's all about data and this one's all about feelings. And the two of those girls need to have access to educational opportunities inside the same system because they lived in the same house, in the same community. And schools have an obligation to celebrate the uniqueness in children. They have this, the, an obligation to make sure that children discover who they are so they can become the best version of themselves as adults. That's our job. That's our second belief system. Our third belief system is that kids' lives will be changed and your lives as families will be changed as a result of being in this school. Great organizations, great schools, great institutions change the trajectory of people's lives. Those are the three things that we believe and what we stand by. We do that through our mission and vision, which is that we inspire and engage and empower young people. That's what we do so that they will become curious, competent, compassionate change makers. It's what we do and the outcome of why we do it. That's the package of what we deliver at ISP. So welcome, welcome, welcome. So what we are working on right now as a school is my job, um, I'm now in my second year at ISP as the director. And um, when the board asked me to come to ISP, what the board said to me was, ISP, ISP is a, a good school. ISP in some instances is a great school. But are we as good as we can be? Can we be better? Well, any leader in any institution is always going to answer that question. Of course we can be better. And as a matter of fact, my expertise as a leader is taking systems that are good and making them great. I'm a good to great leader. And it's about looking at systems that have been around a while and looking at them deeply and asking the hard questions. Why do we do it that way? And can we be better? So we're in the process of doing that, and we're looking at everything. And in some instances, what we're finding is pretty good practice. In other cases, we're finding things that need to be improved. One of the things that we made a decision around now almost a year ago was that we would become an IB full continuum school. So we would adopt the PYP, the primary years program, the MYP, the middle years program, to complement our DP, the diploma program for 11th and 12th graders, we would also adopt the CP, the, the career-related uh, program. We would adopt these curricular frameworks so that we could continue on that journey from good to great. So, a couple things. Um, adopting the framework is absolutely consistent with what we believe about kids about how we um, uh, inspire them to action and what we want the outcomes for kids to be. 
And the adoption of a framework alone does not make you a great school. There are really bad IB schools out there. And there are amazing IB schools out there. We want to be amazing. And what it takes to do that inside of the system is it's not just about looking at the IB framework and doing the IB, but it's about looking at teaching practices. It's about thinking about how we um, uh, um, facilitate experiences for kids and it's bringing experts in to help us do that well. So who you have today is one of a worldwide expert, not in the IB, but a worldwide expert in progressive and contemporary learning so that kids are getting to these outcomes that we described. She works inside and outside of the IB, so she knows the IB through and through. She also works with schools that are outside of the IB. So she can, do, she can do it all because at the core of what she does, this is about learning. And specifically, what we're talking a lot about right now is the transfer of learning. How do we take the things that we're learning inside the classroom and actually transfer them into skills and aptitudes that we're going to use, whether we're going to use them in, in, in higher education, whether we're going to use them in things like service, or we're going to use them in uh, uh, the work world at some point in the future. So her work is all about the transfer. How do we think about learning, develop systems so that it's transferable into the kinds of things that we want kids to be, be, be able to do. This is really, really important because for many of us, me included, we think about our schooling experience and if we see something that is unfamiliar, where we go to as parents because we are extraordinarily and appropriately protect, protective of our kids, we go back to what we know. And we say, oh, I, did, I, didn't, I don't really recognize this over here. And because I don't recognize it, I'm a little bit afraid of it. I'm gonna go back to, I did it this way. Gosh darn it, you should be doing it that way. Well, we, we bring in people who have research and practice and can help us understand how we can do it differently for kids so we can get ourselves from good to great. That's the whole point. We're on this journey. So. Julie Stern, um, author, um, educator, uh, researcher, um, speaker, consultant, mom, and I call her the Energizer Bunny because she has more energy than just about anybody on the planet. Um, and she is gonna make you laugh and she's gonna make you think and she's gonna help you make this connection between what our educators are learning right now. We've had, we had Julie here in August. We have, have her working with our educators on Wednesday, our late start on Wednesday, and we have a contract with her to be working with us through this journey. Edge in education, the connection between what we're doing and what you're interested in so that we can really make ISP a good to great institution. So, Julie. Thank you, Chip. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. Good morning. Um, as Chip said, my most important role, I think, for you all is a parent and a parent of third culture kids. My husband is a diplomat. We move on average every 16 months for the last 10 years um, all around the world. I know. <laughs> um, and so I, I know I sit in your shoes um, and I'll show you even some videos of my kids as we go on this journey. Well, hopefully we'll have some fun here. I'm really informal. If you need to use the bathroom, if you want more coffee, there's way too much food over there that hasn't been touched. So um, with this first activity, I want you guys to move around. Um, and so I have here this um, QR code. If you prefer just to type into your browser, you don't need all this HT, you know, all that stuff. If you just type into your browser, bit.ly backslash, it's case sensitive, capital J, capital S for Julie Stern, JS, then lowercase parents, there's some resources. And I'll put this back up at the end. Right now you might be like, I don't know, let's see if this if is worth it to put this in my phone. Um, and so I'll put it back up at the end. But what I also have here is a video of this um, music group, OK Go. How many of you heard of OK Go? Just cur out of curiosity. Okay, good. I actually kind of wanted you to never have heard of this or seen this video. Um, and so in the, the song is called Needing and Getting. They always do insane things for their videos. So what I would like you to do is over there I have a chart paper. And over there there's a, a chart stand. And even up here there's a chart stand. I want you to put any words 
or small phrases that come to mind as you watch this. So I got us going. For instance, some parents think that this is insane. So insanity is one that comes up. Uh, some parents think that this is creative. So I put creativity. Uh, there's, you can see all of their safety gear here, so they're taking a risk. Uh, so I put that up there. So any words that come to mind as you're watching this, mandatory, you got to write one word mostly because I want you to stand up. So if you don't want to write a word, maybe just walk over and get some water or something, okay? <laughs> uh, so I'm gonna play about a minute of this video and everybody, as you're watching, um, after about 10 seconds, I want you to stand up and either uh, come up to one of these spots and write a word that comes to mind or you know, get yourself some food or some coffee. Here we go. You guys ready? some concepts up on the on the chart paper any words that come to mind as you guys watch this Okay, excellent. As you guys are grabbing coffee and saying hello, uh, adding more words up there, that's awesome. You guys are, are going into things like clever, innovative, fun. There's fun on a couple different ones. Energetic, incredible idea, thrilling, cool, impressive, out of the box on a couple of them. Uh, yes, <laughs> excellent, expressive production. Um, so I love to do this with teachers because they often go wherever their discipline is, secondary teachers especially, like they'll put force and motion and gravity and acceleration and uh, yeah, and all of these different things that they see when they look at that. Of course, music teachers see rhythm and harmony and crescendo and you know all of those things. Um, and so I love to do this and just sort of see what people see in this. And the real reason why I like to do that, and that's what my, I feel like my life's work is all about, is to to train people to see the world through concepts. Concepts are simply, and I'll, or, I'll define them uh, more clearly for you guys, but to me they're simply organizing ideas. They help us to organize our world. And every time the brain encounters a brand new situation, even if you've never seen that before, we're not, usually not preoccupied by what's the lead singer's name. 
uh, or you know, where are they in the specific place of where they are? Maybe you guys were thinking about that. But usually our brain is saying, how does this relate to something I already know? And we're doing that through concepts. So if you take nothing else from today, I hope that you'll see the world through concepts. When I was here in August, I was here all day, the first day with the faculty uh, and the second day. And I think that the morning of the third day, I overheard some teachers who didn't know that I was standing near saying, gosh, I went out yesterday and I saw, you know, I was like crossing a stream and I was watching the, you know, the stream flow and I was just thinking like force and motion and acceleration. <laughs> I was just like living things, ecosystem. I was like, yes. That's what I want um, young people to do. And I'll show you why. I'll show you why that is so important, especially for today's world. So here is my grandmother. Grandmother, my grandmother, uh, affectionately known as Mimi to me, but her name was Audrey. Uh, this is a picture of her at my wedding. She was 93 years old, not too shabby, huh, for 93. And uh, she was a school teacher. She was a school teacher in the United States, in Louisiana. She graduated from college in 1936. And I don't think that she went to a whole lot of professional learnings after that. Um, and so what I want you to do, if you haven't already, go ahead and make friends with somebody at your table, preferably one other person. Because if you try to talk as a whole table, I go really fast and you're going to get frustrated because you're not going to get a word in. So preferably one other person so that you can take turns talking. If there's an odd number, then three works just fine as a little trio for you guys to have a partner. So if you haven't already, go ahead and you know, kind of make eye contact with, with someone just to be like, are we gonna be together? Introduce yourself if necessary. And then for about a minute, I'm gonna play some music, talk about how the world has changed since Audrey was a teacher. So I play some music and when the music stops, that's your indication too? Stop talking and come back together. It never works, but I always just keep trying. Um, so when the music stops, hopefully that's your indication to, to stop talking and come back together. So go ahead and, and introduce yourself um, and talk about how has the world changed since Audrey was a teacher. You probably talked about a lot of different things and I didn't give you that much time, um, but here's three that I wanna highlight. So just kind of give me like a thumbs up or a head nod or something if you talked about something along these lines. Um, so for me, the deluge of information, the amount of information coming at us. I see a couple of head nods. Um, you, can, you can see statistically uh, some things such as people in the 1800s encountered in an entire lifetime the amount of information that's on the front page of a major newspaper today in one day. Like just the amount of information sort of coming at us um, is, is enormous. The level of complexity. How many of you talked about just sort of how complex the world is today? Anybody talk about that? I see a couple of you um, nodding your heads. Not that the world wasn't complex. She lived through the Second World War, um, lots of the Great Depression in the United States. It's, what's that? It's a different kind of complexity. Um, she didn't know that much. Yes, yes, yes. I think that relates to number one for sure. Thank you for that. And it's just overall the pace, the pace of life, the pace of change, the pace of disruption. Um, so those are kind of the major things that I'm, I'm always thinking about what I, my kids are six and eight. They're really young. I'm always thinking about what is the world going to look like when they graduate from high school? What will college look like? What will the planet look like? What will democracy look like? Anybody else think about these things? This is what I do. Um, these are the types of things that I worry about. And so an analogy that I like to use is it's almost as if my grandmother Audrey was standing on a mountaintop as a teacher and she could see all around her. She had 360 vision and it was her job to kind of pull the students up to be able to see and do and understand everything that she knew how to do and, and understand. It's for us more like this. Imagine being a teacher today. We can't see what's on the other side. We have to prepare kids for what's on the other side of that mountain range and we don't know exactly what it's gonna look like. How do we do that? And so that's for me my greatest passion and why I think concepts are the answer to that. So let me just show you an example of how. But before I do that, sometimes people come up to me and say, Julie, life has always changed. You just weren't alive back then. Um, I, I love this visual, Heather McGowan and, um, her website is called Future is Learning because her whole thesis is kids today are going to have to be lifelong learners. They can't just get a job at like 21 years old and then they're good. They're going to have to learn and learn and learn and learn basically until they're 90 because they're probably going to live to 120. I mean, that's where we are. Um, and so this is just showing sort of technology and how technology has changed. And the bottom is, is kind of looking at 
how paradigm shifts, the ways in which we have to think about the world differently. Um, and this was in, you know, over the course of two and a half lifetimes, things were changing. And now today's kids, uh, you know, they have to change and, and understand new things really, really quickly within the same lifetime. Sometimes I'll show this visual and people will say, Julie, what does this even mean, Internet of Things? And I'm like, exactly. <laughs> How many of you are uh, like looking up what is Bitcoin and blockchain and, you know, NFTs and what even is that? My son, my six year old said to me the other day, Mom, I figured out what my logo is going to be for my YouTube channel. What? <laughs> what my logo is going to be for my YouTube channel. It's a, it's a guy doing a front flip in case any of you are in your edge of your seat wondering what it is. But just the notion that he's got the idea of a logo in his, br I didn't teach him that. He watches YouTube, but of course he learns from YouTube what a logo is. And he thought about what's his logo for his YouTube. <laughs> he's I, he does not have a YouTube channel, by the way. I won't allow him to do that. But he's he's ready. You know, once once he 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 gets the go ahead for me or or get or moves out of the house, he's ready with his logo for his YouTube channel. So they always I'm always telling them. How many of you say something similar? YouTube did not exist when I was a child. I played outside in the dirt. Anybody with me on that? Like we just didn't. We didn't. I climbed. My, my son got stuck in a tree the other day, and I was like, I'm so embarrassed. I'm so just get. I get down. I climbed like four times as high. And he says, Mom, how are you still alive? And I go, that is a very good question. I ask myself that every day. Um, but here's an example of transfer in action. What does this look like in the classroom? So how many of you read Beowulf when you were in school at some point? Or maybe you fake read it like I did, like you went to the Cliff's Notes version. Um, so Beowulf, classic text that a lot of high schoolers have to read. So this teacher I was working with said, OK, Julie, how do I center concepts at the heart of Beowulf? What's at the heart of Beowulf? The human experience concepts are culture, narrative, hero, villain, fear, empathy, power, chaos, control. That's what Beowulf is about. And he said, OK, this is a print based text, which we know the world is changing so much around print based. How can I pair it with some other concepts? So the design concepts he chose, which are more sort of the English language arts concepts, are multimodal composition, not just words, but words with pictures or audio or you know, other ways of, of expressing. Um, multimodal composition and analysis with narrative writing or storytelling. So he said, OK, I'm going to pair Beowulf, and I'm maybe going to have them read excerpts of Beowulf instead of the entire thing. If they want to read the entire thing, of course they can read the entire thing. But we're not going to make them read the entire thing. We're going to pull excerpts of Beowulf to do close reading, and I'm going to pair it with a graphic novel, Black Panther. Not the movie Black Panther, but the actual graphic novel, um, where it's much more sort of a story with words with pictures. And the students were comparing those same sort of themes here in both stories, um, just to sort of see what bigger ideas they could draw out about the stories we tell and how they relate to hero, villain, and fear. And this was in early January of 2020, and this is when the United States assassinated General Soleimani, the Iranian general in Iraq. That's what the students wanted to talk about. So often, the high school students hear things in the news, and that's what they want to talk about. And often, we probably were told when we were younger, that's not what we're talking about today. We don't have time for that. But he said, you guys, look, all the same concepts, hero, fear, villain, power, chaos, control, they all play out here. So what the students did was we, they went to several different world newspapers. I think this one is from um, India. And they looked at how the newspapers were telling the story. They analyzed the storytelling of how, how, what's the picture? What's the headline? What are the articles all around it? And what story does that tell? So the first shift that I tell teachers is put the emphasis on the content Concepts. Instead of saying my unit is about Beowulf, my unit is about power and hero and villain and narrative writing. And so then the context, such as text, details, topics, situations, labs, case studies, those become the vehicle for students to understand the concepts and their relationships. So what he did next was he had them put all of those little concepts on sticky notes and arrange them on their desks and talk about how this situation that was happening in the news related to power, chaos, control, group, group dynamics. You can see the students' perspective. You can see what they're writing here. And then they put the desks in a giant circle and they had a conversation about what was going on and linked Beowulf 
and Black Panther, two current events that were happening in the news. And they said that was their favorite class of the entire year, <laughs> of course, because it made it really relevant for the students. Um, and so there's three phases of learning. This is from one of my books, surface level learning, deeper learning, and then transfer is when we apply it to new situations. So he, the students first had to understand what is narrative writing, basically storytelling. They also unpacked what is fear, what is perspective? What do we mean when we say hero? What do we mean when we say villain? And we get to deeper learning when we start to connect those. So how many of you can think about an example that's not Beowulf or Black Panther or this current event that I just said when you hear this question? How do narratives, perspective, and fear impact our notions of hero and villain? Try to think of an example. Somebody, you're thinking about a politician, I know you are. <laughs> or maybe your mother-in-law. <laughs> How do storytelling, basically, perspective and fear impact our notions of hero and villain? Politicians do this all the time. Um, and so this is where we get to deeper learning. We look at a situation like Beowulf, and then we apply it to new situations. In this case, we applied that sort of conceptual question to Black Panther and to current events. Those are the basic three phases of learning that I talk about with teachers. And we'll, I will show you more examples of what it looks like, but concepts play a role throughout. So here's my definition of concepts. There's lots of different ones. I've been playing with concepts for over, over 10 years. To me, they're simply an organizing idea with distinct attributes that are shared across multiple examples. An organizing idea with distinct attributes that are shared across multiple examples. For young kids, I just say they're words we can use to categorize our world. For my very young children, it depends on the age. Like cereal is a concept for very young children and like Cheerios and Raisin Bran are examples. I don't know if that's what you have here in, in Prague, but you know what I mean? Like whatever the, you, you, you guys like a lot of this muesli, right? Um, you know, uh, that's an example of cereal. Um, and so that's, that's really what it is. It's an organizing idea for very young kids. Everything they're learning is a concept. What is a dog is a concept. Four legs, a tail, fur, sharp teeth, a snout, barks. Critical attributes, distinct attributes, that no matter if it's a Chihuahua or a Great Dane, those are the distinct attributes that are shared across multiple examples. They help us to organize our brain. So this is kind of the research behind it, neurons firing in the brain. It's building this organizational structure in the brain. And so this is an example. I made these slides. I didn't do this with my own kids. I'm not that crazy. I mean, I'm pretty crazy as a mom, but. And I've yet to do a PowerPoint with my kids. But I've made this for young children just to say, you might have like a setting neuron in your brain, a plot neuron in your brain, a character's neuron in your brain. The problem with this is they're not connected. And if we don't connect them, what happens to neurons in the brain? Does anybody know? If we don't use them, they die. Uh, they really just like disappear. And so we need to connect them with different ideas. And so my, my young people might say something like, authors often use setting and conflict between characters to develop the plot. So that's the one thing I hope you guys will take from this is that you'll ask your children, how do these two concepts interact? How does this concept interact with this concept? And I'll show you a lot more examples even from younger children. So in my house, because I've got two boys, we are really into Captain Awesome and Nacho Cheese Man. Anybody know Captain Awesome and Nacho Cheese Man? Um, you're like, nope. So this is really good stuff, you guys. This is what, but I asked my son, you know, can you tell me, he's eight, can you tell me about how authors use setting and conflict between characters to develop the plot in Captain Awesome? And this is what he said, I just typed it up. He said, for example, in Captain Awesome Takes a Dive, the author uses the setting of a swimming pool to set up conflict between the main characters and other children. The blob on the bottom of the pool allows Captain Awesome and Nacho Cheese Man to save the day. My eight-year-old was able to do this. So I talk to my kids all the time about concepts. I ask them what they mean. I ask them if they can give me an example and they get used to really seeing it that way. So here's one of my favorite examples for mathematics. This little boy is in grade five and he, let me just turn this all the way up because he has a mask on. He's connecting addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, um, raising to a power and taking a root. How he has those on these little hexagons right here and he's gonna explain to all of us how those things are connected. So here we go. All right, Noah, tell us 
how you arranged your hexagons for the okay, operations. So everything starts with division. So first there's, or everything starts with addition. So first there's addition, and then there's multiplication, because multiplication is just repeated addition. Okay. And then after that, there is raising to power, because raising to power is just a repeated multiplication. Okay. And then there, after, on the other side, um, subtraction is just repeated um, addition with negative numbers. Oh. And yeah, and then the vision is just repeated subtraction. Okay. And then obviously taking a root is just repeated division. Oh. So my everything gosh. sort of grows out of the addition, and addition is sort of like the main middle thing. You guys, obviously, taking a root is just repeated subtraction, right? I like how he says, obviously. And you know the kids standing around were probably like, oh. Um, and so I encourage teachers to do this in, in small groups so that the, the students who grasp the structure can think aloud for their classmates so that the other kids can go, oh, that's how this is connected. And there's not, I love to show this to math teachers because they're like, holy bleep when I show them this. And they say there's not one way to arrange those hexagons, he, but he explained it really well. So it's really about how to explain it. So I love sticky notes. I'm always asking teachers to um, get students to arrange things on their desk, on their tables. If we have time, maybe we'll do something like that together. Um, I want to just show you a demo lesson sequence. This is middle school chemistry. I'm going to bounce all around math, science, social studies. I'm just trying to show you a bunch of different examples. Um, so this is the learning transfer cycle. We ask students an abstract conceptual relationship question we take them through a specific context, they answer the question. We take them through another context, they answer the question. We take them through another context, they answer the question. That's the basic idea. They're deepening and refining their learning each time they come across it. So this is an actual from an MYP school in Bogota, Colombia. This is what the teacher did. How do chemical properties and chemical persistence relate to environmental concerns? How do chemical properties and chemical persistence relate to environmental concerns? That was her overarching question for the entire sort of unit that they did. Step one is similar to what she might already do. Some practical lab work, making sure students understood what are the different types of chemical reactions, what does it mean, what does chemical properties mean, what does solubility mean, of course the key safety. They had to understand what is a naming compound, how to categorize chemical reactions, how to balance equations. They still did all of that essential knowledge, but they knew that it was for the purpose of trying to understand how chemicals impact the environment. So that was the first step. Students were doing practical lab work to get some of that surface level learning so that they could get to the connect phase. So the first context they looked at was a chemical spill. They watched this news story and they talked about how it was about a spilled ammonia. They talked about how the chemical properties and the chemical persistence related to environmental concerns. Why were people in that area forced to locked down in their house and not open the windows and not open the doors, what was going on, how did all of these words relate to that particular example? Then they transferred to batik dyeing. How many of you have heard of this? It's a traditional way of dyeing fabrics in India and many parts of Africa. They use heavy metals. So there's environmental concerns around the batik dyeing. But they didn't say that to the, the students. They gave them a journal article and a news article and said, how does this relate to what we've been talking about? The teacher didn't explain it to the students. They had to figure out how this relates to what they've been talking about. And then they transferred to ecotourism. There was a place in Colombia where the kids would go with their families for ecotourism to see these birds of prey. The birds of prey were no longer showing up. Why? The kids had to figure out that because of the chemical persistence in the water, the fish were dying. And therefore, the birds of prey that everybody was coming to see were no longer coming there. The kids had to figure all of that out. That was actually their assessment task, something the teacher had never taught them before. I've done this many, many, many times, and where, tomorrow what I'm talking about with the faculty is assessment. And of course, students and parents freak out if they say, how can you give my kid an assessment that they've never seen before? And I'm here to say, that is what I want teachers to give my kids assessments that they've never seen before and they and build this progression so that they're able to access it and this is not the first time that they've transferred and all of the students did well on this assessment they had success i'm 
constantly looking for concepts in new situations. And so now I say instead of concepts are like file folders, I say concepts are like planting seeds. We never really know what they'll grow into with our young people. And so if we plant the seeds of these concepts and we train them to see the world through concepts, hopefully they'll grow into something really beautiful. Now, what's the power and potential of concepts across disciplines or across wildly different situations? So I want to just take a few minutes to go there and then we'll end with, um, I think, the thing that I care the most about, which is character, my, my young people's ability to manage their own emotions. That's what I tell my six and eight year old all the time. The best thing I can teach you as your mom is how to deal with life when it doesn't go your way. I said to my kids, have you ever had a day where, the, where everything just happened exactly how you wanted it to happen? And my eight-year-old goes, yes, once. <laughs> I was like, tell me about that day later. But every other day, it doesn't go exactly how you want it. So how do you react to that? So that's how we'll end our time together. But first, I want to just get a little bit crazy with you. This was a moment when Andrew, this is a picture of him recently, but he, he said this when he was four in the driveway with this hula hoop. He said, Mom, the moon is like the Earth's hula hoop because it orbits around it. Four. I was like, oh. And because I'm a super nerd and A-type personality, I was like, this is something big. I'm not sure what, but that is something big. I had been making teachers in my workshops make analogies, and, and I've been using analogies for a long time. But when a four-year-old says the moon is like the Earth's hula hoop because it orbits around it, it just got me thinking about the potential. And I'm a person who believes in the universe kind of talking to me. Anybody else? the Lord, nature, Mother Nature, Mother Earth, whatever. But here's what came into uh, my mailbox about a week later. Trends in cognitive scientists, I'm that nerdy, I subscribe to this. An analogy is a cognitive device by which a concept is mapped onto another concept based on its similarities. Analogies are concepts mapping onto other concepts. Imagine the possibilities to harness young people, especially in a diverse school like this, to harness their prior knowledge, to harness what they are passionate about, and link a hula hoop to the orbits of, of the moon. Imagine the possibilities. And so then I read this book called Upgrade Your Teaching, Understanding by Design Meets Neuroscience. Um, Jay McTighe wrote this famous book that this school was using, Understanding by Design, with a neuroscientist named Judy Willis. She suggested that if you're teaching your children about magnets and the law of attraction, Maybe pair it with a story about a friendship where opposites attract. I happened to be reading Frog and Toad at the time to my kids. I don't know if you guys know this. Frog is super upbeat and chill and Toad is super grumpy. Um, they're very opposites, but they're the best of friends. There's Bert and Ernie. There's so many examples of this um, that are classic. But the idea of magnets and friendship because opposites attract each other um, was her suggestion. So I just thought, what are the possibilities if we play with this? At the same time, I was writing learning that transfers and I was researching a lot about transfer. I showed you guys that spectrum of similar transfer to dissimilar transfer and we added this uh, student action. Students taking action with their learning. And so here's my favorite of all of these where teachers were really kind of playing with this. This is a PE teacher in Alberta, Canada. So he started with defensive stance, player positioning and recovery defense. Of course looking at this in a traditional sport like American football. And then transferring it to what the rest of the world calls football. Uh, defensive stance, player positioning, recovery defense, and then you know what's really important in Canada is hockey. So transferring it to hockey, all within the discipline of sports. But then he said, what about nature and predator-prey relationships? And had the students figure out how predators and prey use positioning, defensive stance, and recovery defense when they're hunting and trying to stay alive. Cool, huh? Then this was in October of 2020, before the U.S. election in November. He had students watch this video of then-President Donald Trump and figure out how he is using defensive stance, player positioning, and recovery defense before the election in his speech. Wow. I know. Yeah. 
it's kind of scary now because we know what happened after that in January. So this is what a PE teacher did. So just the possibilities are endless if we kind of play with using concepts from one field and seeing how they apply in another field. So I wanna end with this sort of demo lesson sequence on social emotional learning. Um, in the United States, advanced mathematics just means more problems faster. And in, in, not in all, I shouldn't say in all of the United States. In my kids' particular school, <laughs> that's what that means. And so I just said, Alex, here's the deal, bud. Just like you have difficult situations on the bus. The bus is a nasty place in the United States. I don't know about you guys. Uh, the, you're, this is a difficult situation and you're gonna learn how to deal with Mr. Alexander and, and you're just gonna grow from it. We're sort of seeing all of these different examples as opportunities for us to grow and learn from them. So I just wanna show you this quick demo lesson sequence on social emotional learning because I think that's the most important thing that we can teach our kids. So I always like to start with examples of a, a concept or a word that my, my children already know. So I might say like a baby learning to walk is resilient. I'm not gonna explain what resilient means. I'm gonna say, here's an example. Dwayne Wade, super famous basketball player. He had a rough childhood. His mom was arrested when he was young. He does, didn't have a father in the picture, but he goes on to be one of the best basketball players of all time. Pop culture, Moana, if you haven't seen it, just know she's very resilient. She saves her island nation from a lot of bad stuff. So then I would ask the young people, what do all of these examples have in common? And I want them to come up with what are the critical attributes. So I want them to talk with each other like I've been doing with you guys. I'm, not, I'm gonna go quickly through this for now, but it's experiencing a setback or a difficulty. You can't show resilience if life goes exactly how you want it to go. You have to experience a setback or a difficulty and it's about trying again and no giving up. So that's kind of the basic concept attainment of I give students examples and get them to pull out what are the critical attributes. Then I might say, can you think of a time when you were resilient? Or can you think of somebody in your life who's resilient? That would be sort of the next step that I would do with students. And then I want to connect them in relationships. So how are resilience and success connected? And it's really important with social emotional learning to start with something that's not your own kid your own life, because it's really hard to grow when you're thinking about something that's really personal. So I try to think of an example that's really light and fluffy about resilience and success. Have you guys seen this kid trying to jump on a stool? His, his hair is long, he's a little boy. He's just trying to jump on this stool. I'm gonna turn this down. How do resilience, I'm just gonna ask you to chat with your neighbor after this video. How are resilience and success connected in this video? <laughs> okay, so uh, how are resilience and success connected in that video? Go ahead, just have just you know say a few a few quick words to your table mates. How are resilience and and success connected in this video? Okay, I love hearing what you guys are saying about the relationship between success and resilience. Go ahead, come back together. We're gonna transfer and we're gonna add another concept. So the main thing I wanted, I want kids to get from that video, so sometimes like we give, when I do inquiry learning, I want students to be exploring something, I want them to be inquiring into it, and I'm also very strategic about selecting which things that they kind of pick and, and look at. So in this particular one, I wanted the idea that the more 
obstacles or the more times you have to try again, the sweeter success tastes. It wouldn't have felt as good if he would have gotten it on the first try, but it felt so good. You guys were even happy for him. Um, it felt so good because he had failed so many times. So failure sometimes can make success taste sweeter. It can make it feel better. So we're gonna layer on and add another concept of collaboration. What is the role of collaboration in my success? Warning, this video is called Thank You Mom, and like I bawled my eyes out the first time that I saw it, so I'm just gonna um, like just kind of put these around and you guys just pass them around if you need. Um, what is the role of collaboration in success? So here we go. Okay, after you dry your mascara, dry your mascara and get over the fact that many of those moms don't age. Anybody was like, I was like, she looks the same. Um, but no, some of those are real, real, real athletes. You might know some of them. Um, and so it, the, for, for those of you who know some of the stories, especially that figure skater, it's even more emotional. Um, but the, the number one, I've done this and in the resources, I've linked uh, all of these videos. If you want to check them out and you want to even show them to your own children, um, they're in the resources, which I'll put back up. But the main word that I get from this when I ask, I've done it with middle, middle school students over and over again, is support. They get the word support. And the importance of support in your success, which for uh, you know, a 13 year old, that's quite profound. They might not think about us and our role and how, how hard we work. Um, and so just kind of trying to layer on these different ideas. Now, um, I would then probably put each word on an on a individual sticky note, resilience, success, collaboration. And then what I've done when I've done this lesson in the past is have students acquire understanding of empathy. And I use a video from an animated video from Brene Brown, which is also in that, that um, resource that I'll share with you guys, where she says empathy is feeling with someone which I think is such a nice definition of empathy, feeling with someone. Um, and so then I might have them do the concept map and draw connecting lines and just like the kid with the hexagons, you know, just kind of talk about how all of these words are connected and have that conversation. When they have that conversation, they're building that sort of schema in their brains. Um, okay, I have two more videos. So if you hate, you're gonna hate me, uh, I'm sorry. So if you didn't cry already, you know, I'm just coming around <laughs> with these. You could just, I'm just gonna walk quietly around and you just grab one um, because I want it to go to a place of empathy. So all of the children in that last video were white. Uh, how many of you know how expensive those sports are? <laughs> Anybody have like experience with how expensive those sports are? So here's a video where all of these kids are facing some sort of obstacle that's different than those other kids. Um, so it's another thank you mom, it's another PNG commercial. 
This little girl has only white athletes to look up to. There's a kid whose mom is duct taping his skate, so you can infer that they're poor. Uh, there's a kid with a prosthetic leg. There's a lot happening in this video. I apologize. Just close your eyes and don't watch it if you're like, <laughs> but I'm gonna come around. Um, so the idea I'm trying to build here, especially with kids like at a school like this, is empathy. Um, because many of them are not dealing with a lot of these issues. So I want them to have empathy with kids who are. Here we go. Ooh, child, things are gonna get easier. Ooh, child, things will get brighter. Ooh, child, things are gonna get easier. Ooh, child. That's a video where we're really just trying to build empathy with our young people. And I always like to end with something positive, especially like the kids who are laughing at the little guy with the duct tape or whatever. I try to end with kids who are doing the right thing. Um, so the last commercial is a Canadian tire commercial. Any Canadians in the room? Once I said that and somebody said, I'm working on it. <laughs> oh, I thought that was so funny. You can infer which country they were from. Um, okay, so this is called Wheels. Um, and it's kids who are showing empathy. So last video. Uh, of, of, of the tear jerkers, and then we'll open it up to questions. Pass, pass, pass. Hey. Hey. I pick up a broken comb. Running through my thin gray hair Though I don't have any plans tonight I'm not going anywhere Well, I should have seen this coming Come on. Don't know why I'm surprised When the best of us steps up, Everybody our nation stands a little taller. We all play for Canada. I like to say we all play for humanity. That's what I want my kids to do. Like that, I tell them all the time. I don't care about math. I mean, I do, you know, let's be honest. But, you know, when their report cards come in, all of those things, I'm looking to see if they are going to do these types of things. That's what I most want for my boys um, and what I'm trying to get them to see. And I think the overarching concept of that video is inclusion. The idea of including that kid and they thought of a way, they thought of, they had empathy and they thought of a way to include him. Um, another concept might be justice. Uh, so I might add inclusion or justice to the concept map. Sometimes I might tell students, rearrange your post-it notes. Take, clean the, clear the decks. And with this new concept, does something interesting emerge? And what's so cool about that is students will say, our idea of success changed over the course of the series of these lessons. That success is about being a better person rather than achievement or things like that. And so I love to do this lesson with students. And what I'm trying to do is sort of get students to look past the superficial features of a particular situation and instead focus on the deeper structural patterns, the ways that underlying concepts connect. 
And so this is what I'm, I'm doing as a, as a person. I'm looking for patterns. As a parent, I'm one of those A-type personalities. I've read probably 75 books about parenting. Um, and I'm just looking at what are the deeper structural patterns when it comes to parenting. And so this was a profound article that I read called How to Want Less. The secret to satisfaction has nothing to do with achievement, money, or stuff. And it sort of led me to this conclusion um, of industrial era concepts as parents, things that we might have emphasized or things that our parents maybe emphasized for us were success, achievement, status, money. Even if they didn't say it, I knew that those were important to my parents in the way in which they interacted with us. Um, and so what I'm trying to do with my boys is emphasize learning and growth and emphasize purpose. What is your life's purpose? Connection with other people. And finally, wonder and awe. How do we get our young people to just be in awe of, of, a, of a bird, of you know anything that, that they see in their lives, of a beautiful song, um, and just really kind of trying to emphasize the beauty of being alive, of being a human on earth. So that's one thing that I've done as, as I'm going through as a parent. So something that comforts me that I've shared with the faculty here, if this is the whole of human history, since, you know, we've been walking the earth and we've got fire and we've got language and we've, we've been talking to each other. Um, the modern way of doing school, of dividing subjects up and dividing kids by age, and they do like math in the morning and you know, science in the afternoon, that has been happening, if this is the whole of human history, for less than 1% of human history. So even though it might be, as Chip talked about this morning, all we know, it's not all humans know, and it'll be okay if we do school a little bit differently. So I like to show this visual just to sort of give me that uh, feeling like if we do school differently, it's gonna be okay. So let's end with Audrey with my grandmother. Embracing change with gusto. So this was my bridezilla moment uh, of my wedding. Do you know what bridezilla means? Like the, when the bride like inevitably goes nuts. Okay, so I told the DJ, I got married in New Orleans. This is where I'm from. Classic R&B, Aretha Franklin, Stevie Wonder. You guys with me? Like no pop music. Okay, I got married in 2010. So this was the number one song. I don't have a video of this. I'm just trying to recreate the moment for you. Okay, are you ready? I hear this. bad romance lady gaga i was like what is that guy doing my husband was like julie just let the man do his job and when it gets to this part this is what i turn around and see <laughs> pumping her 93 pumping her cane in the air so i wouldn't have had that moment if the man hadn't played bad romance and so i just thought be like mimi embrace change pump your cane in the air uh, and everything's going to be okay so that's all i have for you guys i'm going to open it up for questions i'm going to put that code back up uh, that i had in the very beginning in case you want to see the resources what i have in the resources are simply uh, concept samples by discipline the conceptual relationship questions and this worksheet that i used to do this uh, thoughtful parenting workshop uh, mostly for parents of younger kids but I think it really applies to what I share with you guys today so if you want to check that out you can check that out okay thank you guys so very much for being here and thank you for coming as um, Chip said going from good to great takes the partnership between parents so we're so thrilled that we get edge and education back and we had such a great turnout so we have about 10 minutes of Julie's time before we have to transition her to something else so we're open to questions if you need to leave please feel free to leave but questions for Julie I know we're still wiping the tears away yes <laughs> yes I'm just gonna repeat the question so it's on the video so the question is, what do you think about the connection between concepts and values? I think in that, uh, when I had the post-industrial era and, and you know, the, the, the concepts of wonder and awe and, and uh, purpose, those are values. Yes, I would say those were values. I think of the word value as a concept. Does that make sense? So I wouldn't say it's necessarily synonymous with uh, concepts because to me, force, energy, motion, matter, gravity, all of those are also concepts. Uh, the word value is a concept. And I want kids to see, especially at a school like this, that different cultures have different values and different, I, the uh, important concept is worldview. That everybody has a worldview. We often think ours is the best or the normal or the right one, 
um, and anybody else's is wrong, but we want, need to help kids understand that idea that different cultures have different values, different families have different values. How many of you say things like this? In our family, no. Mm -mm. <laughs> like may, your friends might do that, but in our family, we don't do that. That's not what we do in our family. So like building that almost identity as a family is, um, is really important. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. okay. The other questions? Yeah, go ahead. How do we balance um, all this complexity and deluge of information and still try to really raise a decent and wonderful human being who can manage a grounded human being? Mm. Yeah. All right. So, That's a small question. I, Julie, how can we have grounded individuals so I'm going to pull up makers? what I'm going to do for this afternoon. Um, so when, when we see the world through concepts and um, when we train our kids to do that, we empower them to have a sense of agency. And so um, I'm just going to skip through some of these things. This is the, the mental model that I talk about with teachers. I don't usually talk about it with parents because there's a lot of esoteric words, but students acquire understanding of individual concepts. They connect those concepts in relationship. And then those connections, you can see it's like half brain, half connections, or would facilitate transfer to a new situation. And this is called a mental model because it empowers kids to say, I don't know this situation. I've never seen that OK Go video. I've never seen that Masai Mara, elephant conservancy video before, and there's a lot going on in that video. But I do know um, economics. Many of you wrote economics or profit or wealth or different things like that. I do know sustainability. I do know that you know the, the animals need to be able to live and survive. I do know the concept of interdependence. It sort of trains students to look at the world and say, I maybe have never seen this before, but I do know how to figure it out. And so it is empowering. Let me see if I have for you guys, like I have a, a theory of change. It's not in this video, it's not in this one. It's um, the one that I'm doing with the teachers tomorrow. This is my overall theory of change. So you went there, so I'm gonna get this crazy with you guys. Um, so this I wrote in 2020, uh, just sketching it out. Um, the pace of change and the amount of complexity coming at us, this is where I think the world is right now. It's leading to difficulty with sense making. And because we can't make sense of the world, it leads to feelings of chaos, which then lead to addiction, mental illness, all the things that you just talked about before, conspiracy theories, political polarization, backsliding of democracy. So learning that transfers, it aids kids in sense making. It's a sense making framework. It allows them to say, I've never seen this before, but what are the core concepts at the heart of what's happening in Iran right now with the with the women? I understand freedom. What's their slogan is like women, freedom and what's love? I think it's love. Ooh, don't get me started on that concept. That has just blown my mind over the last few years. The concept of love is super, super, super interesting. Uh, but it's a, it's a way of making sense of the world that then leads to feelings of agency and adaptability. It says, I, I know the world is changing, I know it's complex, but I've got this mental model of acquire, connect, transfer of concepts. So that is when we can then build a more equitable, sustainable, and healthy world, when we feel agency and adaptability. So that's overall my theory of change. I know it's like a lot uh, uh, are a big thing to answer your question, but I do really think that if we help our young people to see the world through concepts, see those connections and know that those connections are gonna transfer to new situations, it, it makes them feel grounded. I like that word that you use. I would love to see more of your <laughs> I'm like Mary Poppins. I have this whole treasure trove, but I was just telling Chip actually the last, I love these parent sessions and I'm going to do an online course uh, for, for parents because I think that exactly what you just expressed is so, so important. And I'm going to share my mistakes. I usually start off with a video of where I failed as a mom um, because trust me, I, this is my, I'm just going to end with this. You don't know rage until you have your own children. Am I right? You just really don't know that emotion until you have your own kids. It's hard to be a parent. Uh, so just give yourself a pat on the back for being here, for choosing this school. You're already doing a lot. Um, and and I don't even worry about your, your kid because you're here and you're asking that question. They'll be all right. Uh, thank you guys so much for being here. Please be in touch. Let Teresa know if you have further questions and we'll keep in touch.